Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich freue mich sehr, Sie heute Abend im Namen des Hauses der Kunst begrüßen zu dürfen. Mein Name ist Julia Lorz, Kuratorin hier am Haus. Gemeinsam mit Patricia Dander, meiner Kollegin, haben wir erst letzte Woche die Ausstellung Skulpturales Handeln eröffnet. Und der Katalog ist auch fast schon raus. Da sind Installationsansichten drin. Der kommt dann Anfang Dezember. Das ist das Dummy. Sie können es sich schon mal anschauen im Buchladen. Wie der Titel schon andeutet, Skulpturales Handeln, geht es uns darum, die Handlung oder den Prozess der in der Handhabung des Materials und der Materialität der Arbeiten ablesbar ist, hervorzuheben. Dazu haben wir sehr unterschiedliche sechs künstlerische internationale Positionen vereint, von Michael Beutler, Alexandra Birken, Vincent Vecto, Anita Leis, Kimberly Sexton und nicht zuletzt Flieder Bade die, wie heute offiziell bekannt äh, gemacht wurde, die diesjährige Preisträgerin des renommierten Aachener Kunstpreis ist. Philida Barrow ist gewissermaßen das verbindende Glied zwischen unserer Ausstellung Skulpturales Handeln und Penelope Curtis' Vortrag Figures in a Landscape. Ihr Vortrag findet heute Abend statt in Zusammenarbeit mit dem Museum Ludwig äh, in Köln im Rahmen der Ausstellung Vor dem Gesetz Skulpturen der Nachkriegszeit und Räume der Gegenwartskunst, die ab Dezember im Museum Ludwig zu sehen ist. An dieser Stelle möchte ich auch gerne den Direktor des Museums Ludwig, Kaspar König, sehr herzlich begrüßen und er wird im Anschluss zu Penelope Curtis' Vortrag auch noch Worte an uns richten. Philida Barlow hat sowohl für Vor dem Gesetz als auch für skulpturales Handeln neue Arbeiten geschaffen. Penelope Curtis wird heute Abend auf die Bedeutung und Rolle von Skulptur vor dem Hintergrund Nachkriegsdeutschlands eingehen. Zu Philida Barlow, äh, ich komme ganz durcheinander, zu Penelope Curtis, ich wusste, das würde passieren. <lacht> Nachdem Penelope Curtis ihre, ihre Doktor an der Courtauld Institute of Art, äh, of Art in London errungen hatte, arbeitete sie zunächst sechs Jahre als erste Kuratorin an der Tate Liverpool, die 1988 ins Leben gerufen wurde. Danach war sie zwischen 1994 bis 2010 Kuratorin am Henry Moore Institute in Leeds und äh, seit April 2010 ist sie die Direktorin von der Tate Britain in London. Interessanterweise hat sie auch, wie sie mir gerade noch erzählte, die erste, ihre erste Ausstellung mit Philida Barlow in, uh, im Henry Moore Institute gemacht. Penelope Curtis hat äh, ausgiebig über das Thema Skulptur publiziert und hat wichtige Ausstellungen wie die Retrospektive der Bildhauerin Barbara Hepworth in 1994, thematische Ausstellungen wie Taking Positions, Figurative Sculpture and Third Reich in 2001 und die prokuratierte Ausstellung Modern British Sculpture in 2010 ausgerichtet. Hello, it's a really great pleasure to have you here this evening and we're very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you for coming. Und ähm, ich wünsche Ihnen allen einen schönen Abend und freue mich jetzt auf Penelope Curtis. Danke. Thank you very much. It's like being on the aeroplane with English and German at the same time. Um, and my, my name is very difficult to say, I know. I often find it hard. Um, I'm sorry I can't speak German, so this lecture is in English. Um, I hope you will understand, and I hope I don't cough too much because I'm recovering from a very bad cold. So if I exit, just wait and I will come back. Um, it's quite a complicated genesis, this lecture, and I want to just explain a little because even I find it hard to remember why I'm here. Because I'm here because of Caspar Koenig, and I'm here because of an exhibition that will be in Cologne, but is not yet, which I have not seen. Um, but Caspar wanted a series of lectures leading up to his exhibition in Cologne, which would happen in other German cities and also abroad in London, for example. So my mind is on Cologne, but I am in Munich. So that's already complicated. And also, there is an exhibition upstairs which I have just seen, and I know I could easily talk about it, but I kind of can't talk about it because Caspar's asked me to talk about something else. Um, and he's 
He's asked me to talk about a particular historical period, so I hope that you'll bear with me because maybe you came to hear about the exhibition upstairs, but I, I can't talk about that. I'm, I'm going to talk more historically, and I'm going to talk particularly about Cologne. So, if you want to leave, <laughs> um, do so now. Um, so, I thought about this lecture over the summer because in many ways it builds up into um, the paper that will be in the catalogue for Casper's show. And also the strange thing about writing this is that although I have had a number of conversations with Casper about his show, I can only imagine it, really. I mean, I'm sure, I know he knows what he's doing, but I'm only a part of it. And I will have to see how that part builds up into a whole. So the exhibition is called Before the Law. Is it called Before the Law in Germany as well? Yes. Is it an English title or a German title in Germany? Oh, I know where it comes from, but I just didn't know if it was in English or German. Okay. So, again, um, this is a very, it's a very strict framework, it's a very open framework. The, the title Before the Law comes from this short story by Kafka. And even if you know the short story, which I do now, you don't understand what it means. So it's a fantastic title, but you keep thinking, how do I understand it? Before the law. But it, I found it a, a useful way of thinking about my, my task to write a paper, to think of a lecture. <coughs> and the title that I chose for my paper is Figures in a Landscape. And that came from a half memory of a writer who came from Cologne, Heinrich Böll. And I, I also feel slightly embarrassed because I think a lot of my material tonight is German and a lot of you will know this better than I do, so... Um, I feel very exposed on this little stage and in some ways it feels to me that before the law is like... I feel like I'm on a kind of... Um, you know, it feels like being in a courtroom, rather, giving a testimony. Um, and actually this, this whole image of me in front of this cathedral in Cologne is very close, in a way, to the imagery of my talk, the figure in the landscape. That's how it seems to me. And I also um, kind of spotlight like a, a theatrical stage. Um, I suppose I thought Cologne, after the war, the idea of the figure in the landscape, titles of Heinrich Böll's books, uh, which have always intrigued me, although I can only read them in English, I am fascinated by how they deal with the post-war history of Germany, and I'm fascinated by their titles, which are very painterly, like Portrait with Lady or Woman in a River Landscape. So I like the way that he, he paints compositions with his titles and his words, and I like the way his, his narrative is always ranging across a, a narrow past, a generational past, about 20 to 25 years, and how we remember recent history. And in a way, that's also what I'm talking about. So I'm starting here with this not very good picture, but it does have a London taxi, as you said, um, of Cologne Cathedral and the museum. A photograph fairly recently, from 2005, actually, I'm told, um, which reminds us that in front of the museum is a square named after Heinrich Böll. So this is a memorial place named for the author who died in 1985. And his last novel, Woman in a River Landscape, was published just after his death. And Burl was born in 1917, so very much um, central to the 20th century and to its history. It, having been asked to talk about sculpture after the war, it seemed to me that Cologne is a good place to think about that. It's perhaps the most symbolic city of all European cities, or perhaps alongside Dresden, of <coughs> European reconstruction after the Second World War. And I suppose unlike Dresden, Cologne got to work very quickly in restoring itself, its Romanesque churches, and of course its cathedral. And the famous post-war planner of Cologne, Rudolf Schwarz, described the city as the world's largest pile of rubble. And it seems to me that in literature, and then 
shortly afterwards in film, the romance, the poetry of rubble, of rubbish, of ruins, was very quickly understood in relation to contemporary art. And of, you may know that Heinrich Böll read out his manifesto on rubble literature in the Cologne railway station in 1954. So this is a, a standard academic subject uh, in literature, but much less so in the history of contemporary art. So again, this was my starting point. <coughs> This is just um, some contemporary pictures of Cologne um, during the bombing, the Allied bombing. But Cologne, unlike um, other German cities, as I said, decided to fully reconstruct its cathedral and to do so absolutely authentically so that the methods of reconstruction were in keeping with the old methods. It's a very proper archaeological reconstruction but for Heinrich Böll, it was the ruin which probably had more truth, more reality, more authenticity than the reconstructed church. So this was the, um, the kind of site that he was thinking about at this point. Very much in contrast to um, churches such as the famous church in the centre of Berlin, which was left unrestored. Cologne decided to go for this full reconstruction. One of um, the things I have learned about Berl is how, for him, the ruin is not just um, it's not just architectural or archaeological. It's also really very much about social fabric and about the family and how how the family, how the father. Um, affects the son and how the son overturns his father. This continual process of <coughs> ruination of one generation to the next generation. And it struck me that it was interesting in relation to Cologne, what was happening here is something that uh, symbolizes that Oedipal nature, which is very, very close to sculpture and particularly close, I guess, for me coming from the English tradition we see this Oedipal story of sculpture, of the father being overturned by the son again and again. This is a rather um, fantastic photograph by Lee Miller from 1945, the American soldiers in front of Cologne Cathedral, and I think works very well in relation to this title, Before the Law, and the idea of the gatekeeper, um, the person who holds the viewer away from the landscape, which for me is the way I've been reading this evocative and puzzling title. These are the, the, the doors of the reconstructed Cologne Cathedral, and they're by Ewald Matarey. Matarey is um, perhaps most famous as being the master of Josef Beuys, but it's interesting to me how they follow each other in Cologne in terms of thinking about the historic medieval history of Cologne and the, the very famous and precious medieval treasury in the cathedral and the reconstruction of post-war Germany. So Matarey worked on these doors and he was followed in Cologne and then in Dusseldorf by his pupil Josef Beuys. So this idea again of the, the Oedipal nature, the master following um, for the student is enshrined here, in a sense, in the doors of Cologne Cathedral. Although we don't see this so much here, um, Matarey is a maybe a minor master known as an animalier and primarily worked on, on animal forms. And the animal form is something which you see hugely present in post-World post -World War II sculpture in particular. And I'm interested in the way that sculptors use the animal, and it seems to me that it was a, a kind of excuse almost because they were afraid or didn't know how to or could no longer use the human figure because of what the human figure had come to represent in sculpture during the Third Reich, during the fascist period. So uh, for sculptors who were evading that kind of human guilt, one way was to go to the animalier sculpture if you were still a figurative sculpture, sculptor. 
Another way was to become abstract, but for many sculptors that was a step too far at this point. Mataré is one of them, and a much better known example would be Marini, who became famous really for his use of the animal, and especially the horse, after the war. I've always been interested in Marini because, like many Italian sculptors, he was quite deeply involved with fascist commissioning during World War II, but managed to excuse himself and um, disassociate himself from fascist commissions. And I think he did that partly by going into very strongly animal sculpture and uh, reneging on the human being. But it seems to me that perhaps the first sculpted animal um, to be seen to survive the war was the sheep here in this famous photograph of Picasso's studio just after the liberation of Paris. This is Picasso's man with sheep. And this comes out of a long series of drawings and the, the sheep began in a much more quiescent, almost victim-like <laughs> posture and by the time it had become a sculpture it has become much more active. And this, this was first seen during the occupation of Paris in the spring of 43 and then it was photographed just after the liberation and it's worth remembering that Picasso's studio was on the front line of the fighting during the liberation of Paris. And this almost seems to be like a wartime or even a kind of war photograph. And indeed, this studio was taken by war photographers like Robert Kappa and Lee Miller. So there is a kind of sense of that wartime imagery, I think, that is imbued with it. And also the idea of this man as Christ, even if He's not called Christ. There is obviously a very Christ-like quality in this image. And it was first exhibited in the first salon in Paris after the war, which was called the Salon de la Libération. And this was the first time that Picasso had <coughs> agreed to exhibit in the salon. A similar work from a few years later is The Shepherd of the Lond by Germain de Richier. Again, it seems to me that it's not really a shepherd at all, it's a kind of Christ-like figure who survives, survives the war. I think I need to go and have a cough, I'm sorry. sculptures of this period, you see these kind of damaged figures who are propped up, supported by different kinds of crutches, tripods, trépieds, uh, different kinds of plinths which are effectively making up the damaged body. And the head becomes progressively smaller, either emptied out or closed up or helmet-like. And it seems that this body is it becomes thinner and more emaciated. It's no longer capable of reproduction. It's not a fertile body at all. And the way it's enriched is in fact by the landscape behind it. And it seems the landscape is what, is what fills the body. And it's these surviving pieces which are found among the debris. These photographs, these sculptures and so on are very close to the wartime imagery of the, the way we see the survivor after the war. And I think, I hope you have those kind of images in your head of the, the victim, the child, the, the survivor among the ruins of post-war Europe. I think that Richier, Germaine Richier, knew how her sculptures were enhanced by backdrops because she did so many works in which she worked with painters like Vieira da Silva or Hartung to give her sculptures backdrops. So she was giving, looking at that relationship between the three-dimensional and the two-dimensional, and the, the way that the backdrop filled the body 
I think this happens also with these famous photographs from this period of sculptors in their studios, particularly with Giacometti. Many, photograph many famous photographers like Newman, uh, Morat, and Toineau took photographs in his studios, and again, it's, it seems the studio gives the sculpture its body and its life. It has that textural quality. And I think it's not too far-fetched to think of how this kind of imagery relates to the war and the idea of the single surviving sculpture in front of the ruined city. This is the, the, the famous photograph from 1945, what has become called the Angel of Dresden, but is not, in fact, um, an angel, but an allegory of charity. And this idea of the archaic warriors caught in motion across the friezes of walls, um, and the idea of the a reportage, the, the links between the ancient world, ancient warriors and modern reportage, I think comes through not only in these kind of contemporary wartime photographs, which have this amazingly historic quality, but also in the reconstruction of ancient ruins. And this is the famous gallery in the British Museum in London, the Elgin Marbles, which surprisingly was only opened in 1961. So it's actually very much a post-war project, this, this reconstruction of the, of the frieze. And that idea of the, the sculpture in front of its ruined background, which I guess this emblemizes better than any other image, is carried through in the way that sculpture after the war was positioned firstly and photographed secondly in Castle. This is Henry Moore's piece outside um, the Orangerie in Castle. And I've just spent the afternoon with Walter Grasskamp, whose book about Hans Hacker's photographs of Documenta II, 1959, has now been published. <laughs> this is not one of them, is that correct? <laughs> I've just tried to spend the afternoon working out whether any of these photographs are Hans Hacker's or not. Um, but nevertheless, this is very much um, about the, the quality of the, the sculpture and the ruined backdrop and how, how that backdrop gives more meaning to the sculpture. This is Zadkin's Monument to a Destroyed City, also shown in Castle. And this kind of imagery, the solid single form in front of the ruined backdrop, I think comes really close to some of the famous wartime imagery. This is another photograph by Lee Miller from Cologne in 1945. And it struck me as being oddly, ironically similar to a remarkable photograph from London um, of this lady artist, I think an amateur lady artist, <laughs> Um, painting in the ruins um, of London in 1945, watched by two boys. And this is both the artist um, in the midst of the rubble, the, the notion of the, some kind of resurgence, but also it reminds me, all of these remind me of how the sculpture is positioned in front of the backdrop. But this is um, Zadkin's monument to a destroyed town, as it is in Rotterdam, actually, in the port of Leverhaven. It actually had first been shown in Berlin in 1947, when it was called Monument to a Destroyed Town. And then it was exhibited in Paris in 1949, and then it was erected in Rotterdam in 1953. And then it took on a new, a new energy and a new sense of meaning. And literally it seems to me that, whereas this is a kind of phoenix, and it was described at the time as a phoenix, and Rotterdam was described as a town that was phoenix-like, 
rising from the ashes. It's um, absolutely the opposite to the way it seems in Castle, where it seems to fall and to crumble. And the, the sense of the backdrop and the meaning of the title can make a sculpture rise or fall, it seems quite clearly. A lot of them, um, well, it's very often that um, Zadkin is linked to Rotterdam, but he was not the only sculptor to be involved in the notion, sorry, the notion of rebuilding Rotterdam. And this same horse by Marini was also placed originally on the central Südklein in Rotterdam. And it was called the Great Miracle at that point. Again, its title changed. So if I go back to the first documenta, Documenta 1, there was a, already a very strong sense of how sculpture took on meaning from its surroundings. And this is the, the famous figure by Lembrook from 1917, so a whole generation earlier, um, placed right at the centre of the staircase. And I think a kind of fulcrum, literally a pivot, to talk about Germans' recent history. Um, and the fact that Lembrook had died after, during the, after the First World War meant that he was, in a way, exonerated from that complicated history. Um, but the fact that his images speak of guilt and grief work very well for a, a later generation. The, the placing, so much of the placing, was done by the director of the documenter, Arnold Boder, whose background was broader than a general museum curator. It was much more in exhibition design and also retail design. And therefore he had, a, I think, a more open and a much more um, innovative way of thinking about how to position objects in space. Which meant that for the second documenter, when he went outside, he was able to use the whole stage of the gardens and the, the ruined buildings behind in terms of thinking about how to give sculpture an adequate theatre in which to perform. So he gave works which by themselves can seem somewhat modest and even old-fashioned. He, he gave them a way in which to, to let them be more than they were. And I think that might be one of the challenges that Caspar has in his exhibition, is how to make these sculptures and sing again in a way that makes them not seem old-fashioned. And very often we're looking at these rather fantastic photographs of these sculptures, which gives them a kind of presence which they may not have by themselves normally in the museum. Also, that the fact that the, the museum Fredericianum in, the Cas in Castle was one of the oldest public museums in Europe, I think, spoke very poignantly and pertinently about the idea of the ruin and the ruin of culture, and the fact that the, the museum was semi or even unrestored, the orangery buildings were unrestored at this point, meant that the sculptures kind of stood in this gap between the post-war viewer and what had happened to the, the cultural heritage. So this idea of human dignity was very much germane to the, the subject of document. I suppose it's interesting to me that this, this is from 1955, the first documenter. It's several years later than similar exhibitions which had happened in London and also in Arnhem many big outdoor sculpture exhibitions which never had this kind of meaningfulness that Documenta acquired so quickly. And the meaningfulness was acquired, I think, because of the relationship between the works of art and the building, especially in, in the case of the sculpture. <clears throat> a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the works of this period are are broken or rather thin, as I said, and sculptors concentrated very much on the surface and the painterly surface, but also the incised surface. And there's 
is a kind of um, international language at this point, and you could find any number of examples in, across Europe and also in America of this kind of work. But in contrast, this actually is um, <clears throat> a work by Barbara Hepworth, who's, who gave me my title. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Trust really because she's one of the relatively few sculptors at this point making forms which are not distressed, not aged, but still seem new. I'm crying now. <laughs> um, and there were very few sculptors really at this point of that generation who were able to make new forms, and most of her generation were making old forms. And that's a big difference between her and Henry Moore. And Henry Moore at this point is very much <coughs> looking at the backdrop and providing the backdrop for his sculptures. I suppose Hepworth offers um, a sense of an ideal beauty, which for most artists at this point is nearly unthinkable. And indeed, it didn't really have the international success that Henry Moore did. Henry Moore had a fantastic... Thank you. Thank you. What is it? <laughs> Henry Moore had a fantastic advantage at this point in um, being able to proclaim an almost complete innocence. He had the advantage of coming from Britain. And as you probably know, Henry Moore was more successful in Germany than he was in Britain. He, he found his public in Germany, and he found it through documenting firstly. And uh, he was widely commissioned in Germany. People of his age or a little older, like Gerhard Marx, for example, seemed never to have got over, or, he, or else his viewers never got over, his sense of implied guilt. And works like this Paul and Prometheus from just after the war seem to indicate that idea of the inner exile that German artists went into. And as I say, Marini, I think, was able to, um, to a large extent, find a kind of self-exoneration, but partly by going into these rather childlike images and to what extent they last. We may see in Casper's show, I'm not sure whether he's finally chosen a Marini or not. You have. Because <laughs> I think you've been, your doubts have been increasing about these works as, you, as you've been looking at them. So to what extent these works still um, succeed now and stand up as strong sculptures is very much open to question. It's interesting to me that a lot of the artists who had worked through the fascist regime then went on to take commissions from the church. And here I'm showing another picture, a famous um, place, St. Peter's in Rome, and the sculptor Manzu, Giacomo Manzu, took the commission to redo the doors of St. Peter's in Rome. And very many of Manzu's uh, post-war images were closely connected to the Catholic Church. And it's interesting to see how many sculptors made bronze doors for cathedrals after the war. It was Manzu who took the first prize in sculpture for the Italian section in the first Venice Biennale in 1948. And it was Henry Moore who took the international prize. And I suppose what um, is interesting and pertinent particular to Henry Moore is that he gradually, through this period and into the 50s and 60s, was one of the very few sculptors who was able to actually offer a new sense of place. And I think his sculptures are successful in providing their own sense of place. <laughs> 
And that question of the landscape, the backdrop, and to what extent the sculpture needs its backdrop or creates its own backdrop, I suppose is, is key to the thinking here. So this remarkable image is probably drawing on people's memories of images like that to make it make sense. But I think Henry Moore ultimately was able to disengage himself from that kind of urban, traumatized image and provide something new. I think it's very easy for us to forget how sculpture looked in relation to its wartime landscape. And this is an effort really to try and bring those two ways of thinking back together again. So you've seen this image before by the English sculptor Reg Butler, who was incredibly successful after World War II. He showed in Venice in 52, and was, he took the art world by storm and was bought by every museum, MoMA, the Met, and museums all over Europe and America bought Reg Butler. Um, it now seems to me that he works best in installation photographs, and this kind of emptiness um, and linear construction is something that you see in, the, in this kind of sculptures that you see upstairs. But this exhibition is, fact, is in fact one that I helped work on in the Henry Moore Institute, where I used to be. It's a show called Undone, and it was a, a show essentially about the fragility of sculpture, which is not unrelated to the show upstairs, and how this sculpture can just fall apart. Um, it, re it refuses to be monolithic, it refuses to be solid, it refuses to be stable. And that kind of, that kind of op openness and fragility, I think is hinted at here in the work of artists like Butler, but also his contemporaries across Europe at this point. The, the notion of the armature, the unfinished work, the idea that things might fall apart. I just wanted to end on um, a more topical note, I suppose. In, in thinking about Before the Law, which I have been doing quite a lot, um, I have a very strong image in my head of the doorway, the closed doorway. So the, in the Kafka story, there is a gatekeeper who tells the, the supplicant, the man in front of him, that he can't open the gates, he won't have access to the law, but he can come back the next day. And so he can come back every day, but he never gets access. The doors never open. So is before the law something that is uh, chronological? Does, it, does this mean before in time, or does it mean before in space? I don't think there is an answer, and I don't think you will supply an answer, but the reason it works as a, a title for an exhibition or for a text is that it, it actually starts to create strike quite a strong a visual and a narrative image in the mind. And then thinking about before the law and the doorkeeper, and who keeps us out, and where we are, are we behind the door or in front of the door? What is behind us? I was struck by this big image in the papers in London. As you may know, we've had our own version of the Wall Street protests um, in London in front of St. Paul's Cathedral. So for the first time since the war, St. Paul's Cathedral closed its doors. Um, this was a very striking moment for Londoners because the cathedral had initially decided to welcome the protesters and then actually closed its doors, locked its doors, so no one could go into the church um, for, I think, about a week or ten days. Um, and so you can see the doors here and you can see some of the uh, tourists sitting outside. So all the encampment of the tents is in front of the cathedral facade and the doors remain closed. The church does not admit these people um, through its doors. It was a very controversial decision. For some reason, for some people, it was a decision that was understood in terms of money because St. Paul's Cathedral pays, uh, asks you to pay to go in 
Um, and they make apparently £22,000 a day from people paying to go into the church. So the church has already become a shop, in a sense. The money changes and the temple idea comes to mind quite quickly. So did the church decide to open its doors again as quickly as possible because it was losing too much money or because it had some more Christian um, notion at its heart? So it set up a very interesting idea um, and debate in terms of what does it mean if a church closes its doors and what does it lose and what does it mean to us? And this, um, the image of the doorway and who, the, the, the doorkeeper also, and the fact that this was closely connected to money took me also to thinking about this um, particular building. That this, this was built actually by the English architect Edwin Lutyens, and it was built at um, the headquarters for the Midland Bank in London, and it's on Piccadilly. It then later on became um, a, a disused centre, um, sorry, an empty building, and you can see that it had various uses. Checks cashed, a community centre, and it was to let for some time. And then, more recently, it was taken over by the Gallery House of Vid. So, it went from being a bank to being an art gallery, and it retains its same doors, and um, now they may be open. Um, the facade is exactly the same, it's a listed building. And this is where, until very recently, Felida Barlow had her very large one-person exhibition. So this is, um, this is my final image, and I thought it worked well with the links here between before the law, the idea of the gatekeeper, the question of the church, the bank, um, and the art gallery, and how art inserts itself into those gaps between um, different kinds of establishments, and how art sits there in a way which I suppose is supported but also um, unsupported. So as you, as you can see, Before the Law is a tantalizingly unclear title, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing what the exhibition looks like in Cologne. I hope without the exhibition being uh, in the gallery here, this lecture made some sense to you, and thank you for coming. <laughs>